In the year 401, the uh, prince of Persia, Cyrus, who was a younger son uh, and had been uh, is the, 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 the uh, recent, uh, recently uh, succeeded king of Persia, Artaxerxes, his older brother, was in power. Cyrus had always been ambitious for uh, uh, achieving the, uh, the job of Shah in Persia, and his mother had worked in his behalf, but it hadn't paid off. He was not prepared to accept the verdict, and so, <clears throat> He set out in the year 401 to uh, launch a scheme that would bring him to the throne of Persia. And his scheme was to hire uh, a good-sized army of Greek mercenaries and to trick them into becoming the army that would uh, defeat the uh, army of his uh, brother Artaxerxes and make him king. Uh, as it turned out, one of the men who uh, joined up on that expedition was an Athenian cavalryman by the name of Xenophon, and he left an account of that experience in a work that in co is called in Greek the Anabasis, which means the, the march back. But it's the story of how this body of it turned out to be roughly <coughs> 10,000 <coughs> Greek hoplite mercenaries marched into the uh, heart of the Persian Empire, defeated the army of the uh, great king, uh, but in the process, Prince Cyrus himself was killed, and since the whole point of the expedition was to make him king, there wasn't any point any longer in the great question, I told you about this earlier in the semester, <clears throat> what should these 10,000 Greeks do? They end up, uh, after their generals are put to death by treachery, uh, to elect new generals and to fight their way out of the empire back to the Black Sea, which was the easiest way for them to get home, and then to do whatever it was they would do. Um, it was a very important event because, and I think Xenophon's account of it was very, very important because it planted in the minds of many Greeks <coughs> a new notion. <coughs> that the uh, vast, powerful, wealthy empire of the Persians was remarkably vulnerable and that it was, an it was possible and many thought highly desirable for the Greeks to turn the tables on the Persians, to invade Persia <coughs> and to take from it, uh, to, to subdue it and to take from it the vast wealth that the Persians had. And we shall see uh, down through the years of the fourth century, different um, speakers will come out and speak or write, urging that the Greeks do exactly this. Isocrates, the Athenian uh, teacher of rhetoric, was the foremost figure who kept seeking somebody who would undertake this chore. Uh, and one of the reasons that he gave for it, uh, more than once, was that Greece was suffering, and of course had been for some time, from poverty produced by war and most particularly by civil wars between Democrats and oligarchs that became more and more common in the fourth century. And his solution was, if you need money, steal it. And so take it from the Persians and that would put an end to the troubles. Well, of course, uh, none of the Greek city-states was capable of establishing leadership in Greece during the period we're studying now <clears throat> so that it could carry out Isocrates' wishes. Uh, so he turned to a man that the rest of the Greeks regarded as, or many of the Greeks regarded as a barbarian, the king of Macedon, Philip, and urged him to take on that course. And uh, apparently, whether it was Isocrates or simply the idea itself, Philip himself did intend <coughs> to do exactly that, to conquer the Persian Empire, <coughs> but he was killed before he could do it. And, uh, the job was left to his quite young son, <coughs> Alexander, who in fact accomplished it. But we're looking down the road. Let's go back to 401, and there we see this expedition of 10,000 Greeks accomplishing uh, what uh, I mentioned to you. That there could be 10,000 Greek hoplites available for such a purpose, 
I think, is a consequence of the Peloponnesian War. And it shows us how much that war had helped to uproot people and to um, impoverish many of them, so that the idea of becoming a mercenary soldier for a Persian prince was attractive enough to take them away from home, something that would have been less likely in the prosperous years <coughs> before the Peloponnesian War. <coughs> well, of course, uh, that aside, that's a kind of, it is a kind of a sideshow. It doesn't very much affect what is happening to the Greek cities on the coast of Asia Minor, who remain the issue as to what will happen. You remember, these were uh, under Athenian control during the Peloponnesian War, and when the war was over, they were taken over in many cases by Lysander. Uh, what was to happen to them ultimately still had to be decided because the king of Persia claimed that territory still for his own. <coughs> the Spartans had really <coughs> agreed to that in the treaties they made with the great king during the Peloponnesian War, uh, but now Lysander didn't see any reason for carrying out those promises. And so there was at the very least conflict and of course, what the cities would have liked best of all <coughs> was to achieve autonomy for themselves. And uh, they claimed that and regarded uh, the rule either by Persian or by Spartan as improper and something to be uh, resisted. <coughs> well, Tissaphernes, the uh, satrap of the region uh, of Lydia and to the west, the ones that included the Greek cities, <coughs> attacked those cities <coughs> which uh, he claimed for the great king, but which cities were holding out. Those cities in turn, because the great menace to them for the moment was Persian, turned to Sparta, the great victorious power, and asked the Spartans to help. And in the year 400, 399, the Spartans sent an army under a general by the name of Thibron, who recruited about 6,000 of those 10,000 men who had marched into the Persian Empire and who still sought service as mercenaries rather than go home to poverty, <coughs> plus about 5,000 or so Peloponnesians. Uh, all of the overseas activities of the Spartans in these years include practically no Spartans. They are just too short of troops to be risking them in overseas ventures. So they use their Peloponnesian allies, they sometimes use mercenaries, uh, and they, um, uh, they also use uh, some of these folks I told you about the last time who uh, were neither this nor that. <coughs> this is the, um, the ones that they use on these campaigns are the ones that we are calling neodamodes, people who had been helots but who were liberated uh, and permitted to fight for the Spartans. And the notion of sending Neo Damodes overseas to fight was very attractive to the Spartans because it got them out of Laconia, for one thing, and uh, provided them with uh, soldiers as well. So that kind of army <coughs> is the one that Sibron is now using to fight against the Persians, who just a few years ago had been the allies of the Spartans for control of the Greek cities of Asia Minor. <coughs> Now, meanwhile, we have to turn our attention <coughs> excuse me, to the sea and especially to the island of Cyprus. It's a Persian possession, but on that island there are some cities that have a degree of autonomy. One of them uh, it has as its king a, uh, a man called Evagoras, and he is very ambitious for uh, himself and for the Cypriots, and so he <coughs> Uh, is eager to um, fight against the Spartans on behalf <coughs> of, uh, presumably on behalf of the great king, although we, his motives are not made clear by our sources. Reasonable guess is that he may have hoped <coughs> by do, achieving something great for the great king, he might receive back uh, thanks from the great king in whatever form you can imagine. It might be allowing him to rule over Cyprus. It might mean to give him wealth. Who knows? But also, <coughs> on the island of Cyprus, <coughs> where he had taken refuge, was the Athenian Admiral Conon, 
who had been one of the admirals at the final defeat at Igus Potamai, he had escaped from that battle and had not gone home to Athens. He felt that the air there would not be healthy for somebody who lost the entire fleet at Igus Potamai. <coughs> And so he went to uh, Evagoras, who, who took good care of him. Conon was a great sailor, <clears throat> one of the very most uh, distinguished admirals uh, in Greek history. And <clears throat> he too now continued his feeling that uh, Sparta was the enemy. So he joined um, Evagoras in urging the great king <clears throat> to build a navy which would then defeat the Spartan navy which would by itself rid Asia of the menace of Sparta <clears throat> and be a great thing for the Persians. Conan, I suspect, had some uh, other <clears throat> hopes uh, out of this activity, which in fact will come to fruition. I'll tell you about them in due course. <clears throat> well, so now you have, the Spartans have their fleet out there and the king agrees and he starts building a fleet of his own, which will ultimately be a very large one indeed, <clears throat> some 300 ships, and the king puts Conan in charge of that fleet, which is smart in, in a way because Conan is a great admiral. <clears throat> Maybe not so smart if you look at what Conan is really up to. In the face of these activities, the Spartans decided to raise the ante <clears throat> and they sent an expedition into Asia Minor, uh, Thibron had not done very well, and after about a year, the Spartans replaced him with another general by the name of Dersilidas, who does better. But they, there's no decisive victory out there. <clears throat> the war is dragging on. And so they choose uh, to send the new king, Agesilaus, who is the uh, son of Aegis, who, uh, whose characteristics are, among other things, that he was born lame. Uh, he, he probably would not have been allowed to live had he not come from the royal family, <clears throat> but he did. And he uh, grew to be an ambitious, aggressive uh, Spartan king, who I suspect, I mean, cheap psychology, when you have a handicap like that in a society which values physical valor and strength and, and uh, military success so highly as the Spartans did, <clears throat> you're twice as aggressive and twice as ambitious as an ordinary Spartan. In any case, that was the way Agesilaus turned out to be. Another interesting thing about Agesilaus <clears throat> is that he had been the, the tent mate uh, of uh, Lysander. And I, it's hard to believe that Lysander could ever have achieved the eminence that he did, the command that was given to him, had he not been a friend of the young man that people looked to as the next king, or possibly the next king. <clears throat> but as yet, Agesilaus had, was, was as you, being a much younger man than Lysander, he uh, seemed to be deferential and everything was okay. <clears throat> and so he was very keen on doing what the Spartans did, which was to send Agesilaus out with a new expedition to win the war against the Persians out there. Agesilaus, it is plain, had extremely lofty plans for himself and for this expedition. Uh, the, way the, uh, the, the way the expedition worked, Agesilaus chose to leave with his fleet from the town of Aulis which is located in Boeotia. Uh, does anybody recognize the name and think why Agesilaus should have wanted to leave from Aulis? Tell us about it. That's, where the, the army That's right. Agamemnon took off for the Trojan War at Aulis. And you remember how the legend goes. Uh, the, the, the winds were against the uh, Greeks. They wouldn't let the ships get away, and they asked them, uh, a holy man to tell them what the gods were up to, and the gods said, well, then you can't go until you sacrifice your daughter, your little daughter, Iphigenia, uh, to the god for that purpose. So Agamemnon did, and the winds relented, and uh, Agamemnon would pay the price when he got back from Troy. But it is precisely that 
the Greek fleet against the barbarian, against the non-Greeks, the most important ones in all of their legends, namely the Trojans. It was at all Aulus that they left. And Agamemnon, excuse me, Agesilaus wanted to bring that to the mind. He was the new Agamemnon, and he was not leading a Spartan um, uh, fleet against uh, the Persians. He was the spokesman for the Greeks. He was the leader of the Greeks, revenging uh, that original uh, offense, whatever that might be. He was trying to make the case for a pan-Hellenic motive for what was absolutely a strictly Spartan one and raising himself to a legendary level, practically. Well, that turned out to be a mistake <clears throat> because uh, the Thebans happened at that moment to be, as far as we can tell, led by a faction that was very hostile to the Spartans. So as the Gesilaeus' people were setting up the um, altars for sacrifices before they took off, <clears throat> along the road came a Theban army, knocked over all of the altars and asked them who the hell invited him into Boeotia in the first place to get the hell out of there, grossly insulting Agesilaus and forcing him to skulk out of Aulis, not in the grand way that he had imagined. This turned out to be very significant. Agesilaus took it personally. He didn't like that. And uh, I suppose, uh, well, never mind. I was about to make a bad joke, let it go. Uh, um, and it, it had an enormous impact on him because for the rest of his life, Agesilaus will be hostile to Thebes. And when he could, he would promote a policy of attacking Thebes, of trying to de defeat it, to subject it to Sparta and a whole piece of Spartan foreign policy, which was to be very costly and damaging to Sparta, was the result of Agesilaus' attempt at vendetta against the uh, Thebans. Well, he goes to uh, Asia and begins to encounter the Persians. He does pretty well, as always. Greek hoplites, if they can get the Persians to fight them in a nice flat field, beat them. And uh, <clears throat> he did that on several occasions, but he was never able to bring a large force of Persians to battle so that he could really destroy a good chunk of Persian power in the region so that the victories were not decisive. <clears throat> they could not win the war. You could win the battles, <clears throat> but you couldn't win the war. At least he didn't. <clears throat> Meanwhile, things turned around uh, against the Spartans uh, from the, the side that you might expect, that is to say, from the sea. Conan, <clears throat> with the Persian fleet, sailed against the very important island of Rhodes and captured it, and brought it back to, uh, uh, took it away from the Spartans in any case. <clears throat> Where the Spartans went, you will remember, they established oligarchic governments. And in this case, the uh, victorious Athenian admiral removed the uh, uh, oligarchic government and in its place there rose up a democracy. I'm sure the great king didn't care what kind of a regime it was for the moment. He just wanted to get rid of the Spartans, <coughs> which he did. But it was, of course, uh, on the Greek scene, it was a great defeat for the Spartans and it was a challenge to the Spartans. It was obvious that Conan, at least, and who knew what might happen from, on the part of other Greeks, were going to resist Spartan power and Spartan aggressiveness, and that if he wanted to combat them, he would have to have a navy. <clears throat> and the Spartans set out to increase their navy to meet this challenge. And just to look ahead a few years, as I think we need to at this moment, <clears throat> it was that Spartan fleet that Conan defeated thoroughly and decisively a few years later in 394 uh, at the Battle of Knidos, and which really puts an end for a considerable time. The whole idea of Sparta fighting at sea entirely, it really means that that approach, remember we were talking last time about different, the three different uh, possibilities that the Spartans uh, had to choose among, and they chose for a while this thoroughly aggressive one overseas. That's out now. 
If you've been defeated at sea, you don't have a navy that can challenge your opponents, you can't do it. And as a matter of fact, it will not be very much longer when events in Greece compel them to withdraw their army under Agesilaus and bring him back home. <clears throat> and no Spartan army ever goes back to Asia again. That, we're looking ahead, but that, the action that caused that was the, uh, the victory at Knidos. Now, of course, with the Spartans being defeated in that part of the world, the Greek cities that have been under Spartan rule now typically rebel against the Spartan rule. And we must imagine that for a few years, there are really quite confused conditions in uh, Asiatic Greece. Uh, some places may have <coughs> continued to be under Spartan rule. Some may have continued to be under Persian rule. No doubt about it, some of them became autonomous. We just don't know what the numbers were. <coughs> and there could have been mixtures of things going on too. Uh, I, I make that point because when <coughs> later on a uh, final settlement is uh, produced there, it, it, it is imposed upon a condition of confusion rather than simply overthrowing a, a, a single thing that was uh, characteristic across the board. Still, many of those towns, as I say, did return to Persian rule as well. That's the situation for, uh, which leads us to the next great event in Hellenic history across the board, the Corinthian War. <coughs> as it is called, which breaks out in 395 and runs down to 387.6, so-called because the bulk of the fighting on land was around the city of Corinth. But <clears throat> it, was, uh, it was a war that engaged all of the major cities of Greece uh, right around its core and its center. I think the fair, a fair way to see it is the cause of that war was, in its most fundamental sense, Sparta's tyrannical behavior towards the other Greek cities, which produces a variety of reactions. Uh, let me remind you of some and tell you about some others that we haven't talked about. Remember there was these grievances that lingered from the end of the Peloponnesian War, when Spartan allies like Corinth and Thebes <coughs> had been very dissatisfied with the way the booty had been shared uh, that came from the defeat of the Athenians. And you remember those two cities were aggrieved also <coughs> because the Spartans ignored their wishes as to what should happen to Athens and uh, went their own way there too. I think I mentioned as well that in all contacts with non-Spartans in this period, the Spartans seemed to be very arrogant very hard to get along with, and they certainly inspire considerable unhappiness and discontent. Those things you know about. Now, in 402, the Spartans launched a war against the polis of Elis, located up in the northwestern corner of the Peloponnesus. Uh, Olympia is included in that area, just to help you uh, fix it in your mind. <coughs> Now, the Spartans call upon their allies to join them uh, in this expedition, as is their right, according to the traditional rules of the game in the Peloponnesian League. Thebes and Corinth refuse to send their contingents. That is practically uh, a, a, an act of rebellion against the Spartans. It's a violation <coughs> of their treaty agreements, <coughs> and it shows you uh, how much irritation there existed between them. And the whole, uh, the whole campaign seemed to these states very annoying because why were the Spartans attacking Elis? Partly because they had a continuing debate, uh, uh, conflict with them about a border town, it's the old stuff. But also, I think, as an act of revenge because the Eleans had been disloyal <clears throat> during the Peloponnesian War, during the Peace of Nicias after 421, Elis was one of the four democracies that joined up in this new separate league that ended up fighting against the Spartans for a period of time. In the Great Battle of Mantinea, in which uh, the very existence of Sparta was at issue, Elis was on the side of the enemies of Sparta. So 
That was why the Spartans suddenly decided to attack them, and the allies didn't think that was right, the ones who were discontented in any case. So that's in the background, and uh, the, all these other irritations that I have mentioned, but it wasn't enough, because even if you were as mad as you could be <coughs> at the Spartans and determined to try to undo their uh, effort at hegemony over the Greeks, there was no easy way to think of fighting them successfully. All of the states that were discontented, Thebes, Corinth, and as we will quickly see, Athens as well, <coughs> were isolated from each other. They didn't belong to any common activity. And they all were not as strong enough individually to take on the uh, Spartans. Moreover, there was the problem, if you wanted to fight these people, it would require money. And all of them were short of funds for that purpose. So <coughs> the critical element necessary to create a coalition that could undertake a war against Sparta, that decision was made by the Persians. <clears throat> the king of Persia, presumably, although <clears throat> it very much looks like the, uh, the new satrap in that region, that there were two satraps in the western part of the Persian Empire, remember, the one whose capital is at Sardis in Lydia, and the one whose capital or is, whose territory is along the Hellespont uh, and the Straits in general. Farnabazus, our old friend Farnabazus from the Peloponnesian War, <coughs> and a new uh, satrap in uh, Sardis, both want this to happen. And so uh, they find a Rhodian Greek and give him a batch of money and send him to the Greek cities, seeking out those factional leaders who were known to be hostile to Sparta <clears throat> and offering to give them the, some of the money that was, he was carrying, which was not in itself a vast amount and certainly not enough to fight any war, but was obviously a sign of good faith saying the king of Persia and his satraps in this region are against the Spartans and would like for you to put an end to the things you don't like that are happening in the Greek world and he will support you with his money. That, I think, turned out to be an absolutely critical act. He went, the, the, a town I have not mentioned uh, that belongs in the company of the anti-Spartan people at this point, of course, is Argos, the traditional enemy of Sparta, running back at least into the eighth century and perhaps further than that, um, uh, with, who just seem to find themselves in a war with the Spartans at least once a century. And it looks like this is the time in the fourth century for them. Um, Argos is a democracy, too. And as you know, that is a relevant fact. Corinth is not a democracy, <clears throat> but they are so angry they want to play, too. And they join up. Thebes, again, it's hard to tell what the government is. It looks throughout this entire period as oligarchy and, and democracy may well have been very close to one another, so that at any time, one faction or the other may have the upper hand. Uh, and of course, Athens, which is a democracy again. Now, the Athenians have been very, very reluctant to do anything to annoy the Spartans for very good reasons. They have no navy, they have no walls, and they have no money. So to buck the Spartans would be an act almost of suicide, because all the Spartans need to do is come marching into Attica, and they have no defense. Up to now, therefore, they've been very, very careful not to annoy. In fact, in 402, when the uh, Thebans and the Corinthians refused to go to uh, Elis with the Spartans, the Athenians sent their force as they were required to do by their treaty with the Spartans. But the new situation changed things in Ad Athens just as it did, or perhaps even more than it did in other cities. Now the great king, the Persians were not the enemy, the Persians were going to support the war if they were ready to launch it against the, uh, the um, Spartans. There was no war yet, I should point out, when this money is being handed out. This is an effort to stir up that kind of activity. Of course, the enemies of the policy refer to these, uh, uh, th these transfers of money as bribes, and there's no, nothing in Greek practice or Greek tradition to uh, reject the idea 
that some of these uh, Persian coins ended up in the pockets of the men that they were uh, given to. But I don't think we really should think of them as bribes. <coughs> Most of the money was used for the purpose for which it was intended, to help these leaders stir up support for a war against Sparta. It was something they believed in anyway. It was uh, a source of uh, their ability to carry out their wishes. Uh, as, but as I say, the, the, the Greeks didn't think there was anything wrong with picking up a few bucks uh, along the way. <coughs> now, a war breaks out on the frontier between uh, Phocis and Locris, two towns in central Greece, both of which are quite close to uh, Boeotia, uh, the land ruled by the Thebes. <coughs> the Spartans, and I think this was probably, well, I'm, I'm pretty confident that it was uh, what this, uh, <coughs> motivated by uh, the Spartan unhappiness about Thebes. The Spartans assist Phocis against Locris, knowing that Thebes is allied to Locris and that this would be, they believed and hoped, a pretext for war. This was their chance to get even with the Thebans for all the things that the Thebans had done <coughs> that irritated them since the war. So Sparta invaded Boeotia. Their strategy in, to win this war was that they would invade Boeotia from two sides. One army coming from central Greece, from the region of Phocis and Locris, where they were assisting the uh, <coughs> Phocians and another army being sent up from the Peloponnesus itself. They do finally meet in 395 at a town in western Boeotia called Haliartus, <coughs> where the, there is a battle uh, and where, by the way, um, Lysander is killed in the fighting and removed from the scene. But even before that happened, as it was clear <coughs> that the Spartans meant to fight the, the Thebans. The Thebans went to Athens and asked the Athenians for help. <clears throat> and of course, they had a case that was very attractive. First of all, they <clears throat> certainly reminded the Athenians of the role Thebes had played in liberating Athens by uh, giving a home to Thrasybulus and his free Athenians <clears throat> uh, when they were in the position of defeating the 30 tyrants and driving them out. <clears throat> I have a feeling they didn't remind the Athenians about that little congress they had after the war in which they suggested that they destroy all the Athenians and uh, take away their land and turn the whole place into a great big uh, cattle farm. I think they probably didn't remember to mention that. But, <clears throat> uh, but they had that reason. But more important than that was what they were saying, uh, you have a chance now to escape from your bondage to the Spartans where the Athenians certainly were and to reestablish yourself <coughs> as an autonomous polis uh, along with us and all the others who want to take away power from the Spartans, which they are abusing so terribly. Now, the remarkable thing to me is that Xenophon, who very likely was there, <coughs> uh, reports that the Athenian assembly voted unanimously in favor. Well, it's, it's worth pointing out, of course, that the number one advocate of doing that, of joining the uh, rebellion against, uh, against Sparta, was Thrasybulus, the great hero of the time. <coughs> that certainly made a big difference. And Thrasybulus had been one of the cautious leaders before who had been against getting these Spartans mad <coughs> because he knew Athens was incomp incompetent to fight them now. But with the Persian support and with the prospect of forming a coalition against uh, Sparta, the strategic situation had changed and Thrasybulus now came out 100% for the war. But unanimous vote in favor of the war? I can't imagine the Athenian assembly giving unanimous vote in favor of getting a drink of water. <clears throat> it's just so incredible to me. So how do I explain it? Well, I gotta make it up. I think of, there was an overwhelming sentiment in favor. Obviously, the attractions were great, but there were reasons to fear if you lose, the price could be very, very high. But I think what happened was that the emotion was so strong at the, at the moment that once it was evident that there was a large majority in favor of the motion, 
uh, nobody wanted to be seen as being against it. It would have had the, the look of cowardice, of a lack of patriotism. And, and people in these circumstances, it has been my experience, hate to seem not to be going along when everybody is enthusiastically going in a particular direction. So that's how I interpret Xenophon's remarkable testimony. But whatever, whatever is the truth of it, what is clear is that great enthusiasm, overwhelming majority, they are prepared to fight for their true autonomy in the, the war to come. Um, so the coalition is finally formed. Athens, Thebes, Corinth, Argos, those are the main states on the mainland, and they'll do most of the fighting, but it's worth pointing out that there are other places that join too. Euboea, the island to the east of Attica, not surprising. They're so thoroughly influenced by the Athenians, that's not a great surprise, but it's interesting that many a town up in the north of the Aegean on the Chalcidice also joined in this uh, anti-Spartan coalition, and likewise the region in the west in the, on the Ionian Sea uh, of Acarnania also joined, which <clears throat> I think suggests that there was quite a lot of anti-Spartan sentiment in the Greek world at this time, which you know, very often comes about if any state seems to be too strong, too, too uh, too powerful, too much of a threat to what everybody else wants, people tend to cut it down. Political scientists uh, tend to <clears throat> formalize this into the notion of a, um, what do you call it? Uh, if, you, if you join up with the most powerful state, that's called bandwagging. What do they call bandwagoning? What do they call it if, if you're against the, uh, other, balancing, that's the word. Sorry, I'm weak in my political science technology. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, balancing is what's supposed to happen. The truth of the matter is that you never can tell which way st states will go in these situations, and there you are. But in this case, there, I'm simply making the point that there was a, a lot of hostility to Sparta out there, and some people you wouldn't think of joined in this. But it's the big four that uh, really matter, and they do most of the fighting in the war. Well, there's no point in going through the war in great detail. Uh, just a few highlights, I think, need to be mentioned. The largest highlight of all being, how in the world are you supposed to win this war? What is the, the, uh, the, the strategy on each side? <clears throat> and it's remarkable how similar they are. The Spartans want to gain control of the Isthmus of Corinth, which Corinth and Megara especially, so that they can get out into central Greece and defeat their opponents individually, in Boeotia for the Thebans, in Attica for the Athenians, uh, and Corinth, of course, <coughs> uh, right there in the Isthmus. The uh, other folks, uh, the, the, the big four, want to push into the Peloponnesus where they can raise up rebellion of the um, Helots and the Perioikoi and defeat the Spartans right there and strip away their allies in the Peloponnesus. So <clears throat> each side basically has to gain control of the Isthmus and then move forward to carry out the uh, conclusion of the war in their favor. <clears throat> and the bottom line is neither side is able to do it. The bulk of the fighting <clears throat> throughout the years of that war uh, surround the city of Corinth. Walls are put up by the Corinthians meant to keep the Spartans out. They do so for a great chunk of time. The Spartans can take part of the walls, but they can't manage to take everything and to punch through. And so for all these years, that's what happens. There are some big battles <coughs> that are fought. There's one in 394, soon after the beginning of the war, <coughs> at Nemea, which is located to the south of the, of uh, Corinth. It's a very big, tough, standard hoplite battle, both sides having strong armies, both sides fighting <clears throat> well and determinedly. The Spartans technically winning. It's one of those victories where you know who won because they put up the trophy and they were able to collect their dead and the other guys had to ask permission to, co to collect their dead. 
But it was another one of these victories that did not have strategic consequences. Neither side had been able to destroy the other. Neither side <coughs> could now advance into the region that they had to get to <coughs> in order to make a difference. So uh, that, I think, is the, the major story of that war. There's another side, <coughs> another event in there that has interesting consequences for future Greek warfare that deserves mentioning. At a certain point in that war, the Athenians, under an extraordinary general by the name of Iphicrates, <coughs> had put together a, a force of light-armed troops, not hoplites, people without hoplite armor and shields who uh, threw missiles <coughs> at the other side, probably mainly <coughs> slingers, but they also would have been spear throwers, throwers, not thrusters, <coughs> and uh, uh, bowmen. And th these guys could never confront the phalanx in a normal way, and they would normally not even be able to do much harm <coughs> in, in an extraordinary way. But that, what was new was that Iphicrates had trained them as a professional force <coughs> so they could move swiftly and together as a body in such a way as to be as effective as it was possible for light armed troops to be against an, uh, a phalanx. <coughs> and it happened that um, Iphicrates was able to maneuver a whole division of Spartan soldiers it's just in such a way that they got stuck in a dead end, in a cul de sac, and were absolutely victimized by Iphicrates' um, light armed forces. And uh, about uh, 600 men making up this division of the Spartan army called, uh, the division is called a mora, <laughs> were wiped out. And the Greek world was astonished by this because no such thing had ever happened before. <coughs> And it led to the increased use of uh, well-trained, light-armed infantry who play a larger role. They never replaced the phalanx as the major <coughs> form of land warfare, but they, things become more complicated in the fourth century, as they have already begun to be in the Peloponnesian War, as you have different branches that are able to perform more usefully than they were typically expected to do in the past. <coughs> Um, uh, perhaps as big an event as any that occurred in that war <coughs> was the event I had mentioned earlier, <coughs> Conan using the Persian fleet, defeating the uh, Spartan uh, fleet at the Battle of, uh, anybody take a note? It's just gone out of my mind. Knidos, Knidos, 394. <coughs> But what does he do? Conan takes his victorious fleet, sails back to Athens. The Athenians have already begun the process of rebuilding their walls, but now with the help of Conan's men and the money that he carries and gives to them, they are building those walls at a much faster clip, and before the war is over, the Athenians will once again be a walled city with a walled port and with long walls connecting them. In other words, <coughs> the basis for having an independent naval policy will be in place <coughs> thanks to Conan's victory. On top of which, <coughs> he takes the Persian fleet and goes to the Athenians and says, this is now your fleet. And suddenly the Athenians have again probably the biggest fleet in the Greek world, <coughs> just like that. Similarly, or rather as a consequence of all this, because for a while at least they are able to dominate the Aegean Sea with these forces and with Conan around, <coughs> they regain those famous islands that are so crucial to them, the stepping stones to the Hellespont, Lemnos, Imbros, Skiros, <coughs> become Athenian owned again. They also gain control of the sacred island of Apollo at Delos. They also make an alliance with the important island of Chios. And suddenly you have what are the, the bare beginnings of the reconstruction of the old Athenian naval 
alliance. You might want to call it an empire. Let me make it very clear <coughs> that even when they become far more powerful in years to come, they are never able to recreate the old Athenian empire. They never reach the point which was so decisive for their power where <coughs> it is truly an empire, where almost every state in the league is contributing money which allows the Athenians to not only build <coughs> but to sustain in peacetime and wartime <clears throat> the biggest navy and the best navy around. They never get there. They do become very important as a naval power again. They are <clears throat> going to be a very significant state again. But even though they are turning in that other direction, they never get there. But I think we need to remember that probably there's a very good chunk of the Athenians who regard <clears throat> those days as the good old days and as the natural state of things and as the place to which they ought to be going towards that empire. Certainly a lot of their behavior in the Corinthian War and afterwards <coughs> suggests that that was a widespread opinion. There was undoubtedly also <coughs> hostility to that <coughs> opinion as people look back on the experience, what happened last time, look at the, look at the consequences. There were important socioeconomic, political significance of pursuing such a policy. It meant democracy. It meant the naval democracy. It meant the most extreme democracy. And a lot of people's memories, especially those of the rich, were of the, the mistakes and defeats that that democracy had brought about. <clears throat> when you read Plato particularly about the Athenian democracy, or even Aristotle, <clears throat> I think you have to remember that these people were very, very critical of what the Athenian democracy had done in the fifth century, blamed the democracy for that defeat, <clears throat> and then t that was tied up with their political views in general that democracy was a very bad, wicked uh, thing. Uh, so, and that, that should help you understand this very strong bias against democratic government on the part of such people. Another special event in the course of the Corinthian War, which would have some consequence <clears throat> for Greek life later on. During that war, there was a union between the cities of Corinth and Argos. <clears throat> it was brought about by a special emergency situation created by the war in which all the fighting was around Corinth, in which there was terrible destruction of Corinthian property, <clears throat> in which poverty came to be a problem in Corinth in a way that it had never been. <clears throat> there was a topsy-turvy situation. It, it had been throughout the whole fifth century, back into the sixth century, <clears throat> an oligarchic government, a broad oligarchic government, one that was widely thought to be a good government, <clears throat> uh, and that, so far as we know, was never touched <clears throat> until sometime here in the Corinthian War when these extreme conditions produced what looks like a democratic faction which seized power, which murdered <clears throat> the leaders of the opposition in a brutal way. By the way, on a holy day, uh, it was a, a memorable and horrible event. <clears throat> so um, it was after that event had taken place that you see this union between Argos, which is a democracy, <clears throat> and this democratic government in Corinth, which is under siege for the reasons that I've suggested. And uh, what they do is they arrange for a new situation where citizens of one state <clears throat> will be citizens of the other as well. So theoretically, if you lived in Corinth and you wanted to go to Argos to sit in on the Argive assembly, you could do it, <clears throat> and vice versa. <clears throat> this is something absolutely new. The idea of anything but a polis being by itself or being on top of other polis, but <clears throat> the notion of there being a sharing of a regime, interpolis sharing of, of governmental responsibilities <clears throat> is really new. And it becomes more <clears throat> usual in the course of the next century and the century after that. This one hardly lasts at all. It's just a few years as a consequence of the war and it's undone at the end of the war. <clears throat> but it's an indication of what people might be thinking about. And uh, we shall see that in the course of this century, um, there will grow up federations, 
That's something different, but still it's the same thing in, in a way. A federation is a political union that allows for the maintenance of local powers on the part of the original members, uh, but also takes some powers for a central body which is made up of more than one. <coughs> We Americans, of course, have some idea about that. But there was, there was the Arcadian League that came into being and the Achaean League that came into be being and the Aetolian League which came into being. And as a matter of fact, <coughs> our founding fathers read very carefully about these experiments in federal government as they were writing the American Constitution. We have hard evidence about that. The best evidence for <coughs> those uh, um, confederations uh, does not occur in our period. It occurs later, typically in the third and the second centuries uh, BC, and the, and the accounts of them are in the works of Polybius, um, if you're ever interested. So Polybius was a very important figure <coughs> for the American uh, uh, founding fathers who wrote the Constitution. But the first seed of this kind of interstate uh, cooperation on a basis that was not merely alliance. <coughs> but was co-citizenship is in the case of uh, Corinth and Argos in the course of this war. Well, as the war dragged on, it became clearer and clearer that neither side had any way of prevailing. But another thing that happened that was to play a very important part in how the war came to an end was that the Athenian control of the sea was rapidly making Athens stronger and stronger and more like that scary thing <coughs> which Athens had been to its neighbors and its opponents in the fifth century BC, such that the Persians, who after all had started the war by virtue of uh, encouraging the anti-Spartan factions to get together and had, had been supporting it to some degree during the war in general, began to feel that maybe Athens was becoming more frightening from the Persian point of view than Sparta was. After all, Sparta was out of the Navy business now and they were not likely to be able to get back into it. <clears throat> and if you don't have a Navy, you really can't threaten Persia very much. So at least until Alexander came along and figured out a, a way to do it. So um, all of that gives the Spartans, who really want to get out of this war, because it isn't going anywhere, the, the, uh, the, the hope that they can bring about a peace. And so the Spartans try to make peace <coughs> with the aid of Persia. There's a Spartan uh, political figure by the name of Antalcidas who emerges on this scene, and we shall see that in his life, the few times we hear about him, he's always engaged in attempting to contain Sparta's ambitions to certainly exclude the possibility of overseas commitments. And I would argue, I think most scholars would agree, even to not to be engaged outside of the Peloponnese is very far. <clears throat> he seems to represent a traditionalist point of view, which obviously comes to the fore as this war, which the Spartans have started really, as part of a Gesileus' aggressive policy, isn't working. The Spartans are having to constantly fight. They are suffering casualties. Their allies are becoming more and more restive. And look what's happened. Suddenly Sparta, which was absolutely in charge of everything, is uh, practically on the defensive. So for all these reasons, there's opposition to the bold policy, and Talcidas represents that. He, he gets the Spartan assembly, or the Spartan gerousia, and efforts to support a mission to the king of Persia in which he tries to negotiate a peace. It doesn't work in large part because the enemies, that is Athens and, and uh, Thebes particularly, and perhaps the others as well, no, I'm sorry, Corinth and Argos also, I'll tell you why in a moment, are not ready to do what is necessary from the Spartan point of view. What the Spartans really want is to break up this coalition and all anti-Spartan coalitions. That's really the bottom line for Sparta. <clears throat> it's no sense making peace if you leave these people intact. What's to stop the whole thing from happening again in the future? That's the bottom line and they are unable to persuade the Greeks to make the concessions that are necessary. 
So the war continues <coughs> and nothing really changes except things get worse. This time, the, uh, Antalcidas again negotiates a peace and he really negotiates it with the great king of Persia. The king of Persia has changed his mind about where the great threat comes from. Thrasybulus in the 390s, in the latter part of the 390s, <coughs> engages in a series of naval campaigns all around the Aegean Sea in which he recovers one city after another that used to be under Athenian rule and once again puts it under Athenian rule. He even once again starts collecting money from them. <coughs> he did something also that the Athenians had done late in the Peloponnesian War. He establishes a customs house in the Hellespont, in the uh, Bosphorus, and every ship that goes through pays a tax to the Athenians. Uh, <coughs> so. There's a real feeling in Persia, obviously, that this, the Athenians are coming back to rebuild their empire and we'd better stop them and the Spartans uh, are safer from our point of view, having been chastened by events. And so I think that's probably the single most important reason why the great king comes out and backs, and as we shall see, insists on a peace in Greece which meets Sparta's needs. And the needs are that all these international organizations should be broken up. Obviously, the, the uh, League of Four States that have uh, conducted the war must stop. But on top of that, the union between Argos and Corinth must be broken up. That's especially critical to the Spartans. That's right next door. Argos would be strengthened by its association with Corinth and if it was allowed to continue, it would be a problem in the future. So it had to be broken up. Thebes, of course, was a great problem for the uh, Spartans, and they insisted that for peace to come, the, Boeotia, the, Thebes had, the Thebans had to give up their control of Boeotia. They had used the war as an opportunity to reconstruct the old Boeotian League, which left Thebes at the head and in control of the bulk of Boeotia. That was to be broken up in order to uh, reduce Theban power. <clears throat> and originally the Spartans had wanted the Athenians to give up the things that they had acquired in the course of the war, but they couldn't do that. S Athens was still too strong in the one field that they couldn't be challenged in easily, their control of the sea. And so the, a compromise had to be made if a peace was to be made. Athens would not join unless it was allowed to keep Lemnos, Skiros, Imbros. So that was permitted. So the peace came and it, uh, the critical part, Xenophon reports the exact language <coughs> of a message that King Artaxerxes sent to the Greeks that was in effect the uh, instrument that made the peace. Here's what it said. King Artaxerxes thinks it just that the cities in Asia and the islands of Clazomene and Cyprus shall belong to him. Further, that all the other Greek cities, small and great, shall be autonomous. Listen to that word, that's critical. Th this piece is associated with the principle of autonomy. There shall be no breach of autonomy. Except, says the king, Lemnos, Imbros and Skiros, which shall belong to Athens as in the past. If any refuse to accept this peace, I shall make war on them along with those who are of the same purpose, both by land and sea and with both ships and money. Ancient writers and modern writers uh, have disagreed as to what is the name of this peace. Some of them, them speak of the peace of Antalcidas. More of them, I think, speak, and I think they're right uh, in this decision, as the king's peace. This is not the product of a negotiation, and the king is very careful, even though it, it really is, but he's very careful to make it clear that that's not the way he sees it. This is a command leveled by the king at the Greek say, saying, this is how you will be. I say so, and if you don't like it, I will beat the hell out of you. That's the message <clears throat> that comes. 
But of course, the reason he can say that with as much confidence as he does is that his partner in the peace is Sparta. This is a peace that will benefit Persia and benefit Sparta at the expense of everybody else. The Spartans take it as a license to run Greece in the way that they see fit. Notice nobody says that the Spartans have to break up the Peloponnesian League. That doesn't count as any kind of a violation of autonomy. And so that's <coughs> the nature of the peace. One the, among the results are that the Asiatic Greeks are abandoned by the Greek people, for, uh, by the Greek states once and for all, and of course that means Sparta mainly, until finally uh, Alexander will impose his rule when he conquers the Persian Empire. The Boeotian League is dissolved, Argos and Corinth are split, and Athens loses all that has been gained except for those three islands that are mentioned. Sparta regains and in a certain sense gets greater control of the mainland Greek situation. <clears throat> it is the hegemon of Greece now as a kind of a partner of the great king, and the great king leaves Greece essentially to the Spartans without any interfering. How did he do that? How did they do that? In the same way that they did it to win the Peloponnesian War. An enemy of the Spartans would say because they were Medizers. They had done the work of the Persians. They had collaborated with the Persians against the Greeks. That's not how the Spartans saw it, of course. They would have said something like, I guess there's a crack in Plutarch somewhere. It said, we have not Medized. It's the Spartan, it's the, the, the Persians who have Spartanized. But uh, that's a very kind way of looking at it. <clears throat> it is without question, if you look back on it, that we're talking about just about 100 years after the Persian War. And it's a reversal of the Persian Wars. The Greeks won the Persian Wars, and the proof of it was they chased the great king out of Europe, uh, eager to stay alive and completely unable to do anything about what the Greeks were to do with the uh, coastal regions of the Persian Empire. <clears throat> now the king of Persia is telling the Greeks what they must do. It was widely seen, seen as a cause for great shame and by those people who were not friendly to Sparta, a great, uh, a great cause of anger against the Spartans who were responsible for this condition of things. But the Spartans didn't care much because they were now in a position to exercise the power that the dominant force in Sparta, who was Agesilaus and his supporters, uh, wanted to do. So in 385, we see uh, the Spartans attacking um, the city of um, Mantinea. Once again, the story is very much like the story of Elis in uh, 402. Uh, this time, Mantinea had been, again, one of those states in the Peloponnesus that had joined in a quadruple alliance against Sparta in 421. <clears throat> the great battle that so much threatened Spartan existence in 418 had been fought on the territory of Mantinea. It had <clears throat> a democratic history and democratic tendencies. So, with no, no pretext really at all, the Spartans invaded their territory, besieged the city, managed finally to, uh, to um, defeat Mantinea by sending, uh, diverting the waters of a river that ran through Mantinea to the point where it undermined the walls and they had to surrender. Xenophon learns an important lesson about warfare in, uh, from this event and he concludes his account of this by saying, well, that shows you that you should not build your city around the river. So any of you are planning, keep that in mind. <clears throat> um, then uh, soon afterwards, the Spartans turn on another city in the Peloponnesus, the city of Phlaios, which is not to the, it's to the southwest of Corinth. Not a very big city, but not a small, tiny one either. And what it turns out here is that the, the thing that the Flyasians have done that the Spartans don't like is that they have been a democracy for a part of the time. And um, King Agesilaus basically removes the government after 
fighting a war and besieging the city. It was not an easy task. It, it was expensive and time consuming. But they finally do establish, uh, it, they do gain a victory. And uh, Gesilius puts in a new government <coughs> made up not just of oligarchs, which of course they were, but they were the personal friends of Agesilaus. It's, if you look at it, historically, it resembles the stuff that, like uh, Lysander was doing at the end of the Peloponnesian War and afterwards, in placing these uh, decarchies of his friends <coughs> in the cities so that they would not be only pro-Spartan, but pro-Lysander. And here, Agesilaus did the same thing in Phlius, <coughs> and it's not the only place that he did. <coughs> and then, Enormity followed enormity as the uh, Spartan power was unchecked in this period of time. <clears throat> Up in the north, the uh, city of Olynthus in the Chalcidic Peninsula was gaining control of that peninsula, basically establishing itself as the hegemonial power over cities in that region. In 383, <clears throat> a couple of cities up in that region came to Sparta complaining of what the Olynthians were doing and urging the Spartans to uh, defend them and to undo these things, using as the basis for their appeal the king's peace. This was a violation of their autonomy. The Spartans were to be the upholders of Greek autonomy according to the king's peace, <clears throat> and so they ought to send a force up. And the Spartans did so. And in the course of uh, that war, which lasted from 382 to 379, <clears throat> they defeated Olynthus, dissolved the Confederacy, and <clears throat> destroyed uh, any, again, any notion of a league <clears throat> other than the Spartan League. But ev there was an event that was connected with that movement up towards uh, the Northeast, up to the Chalcidice, which was the most famous, I think. It's, there's a small competition for a couple of events, but one of the most famous anyway in this period, illustrating the arrogance and power of the Spartan hegemony. A Spartan force was sent off ostensibly to reinforce the, their a Spartan army up there in the Chalcidice. It was led by a general named Phoebidas. <coughs> As he was moving north on a route that would not have been the normal route to take, a route that took him right past the city of Thebes, he camped out <clears throat> at night and uh, on his way there he was contacted by uh, an important official uh, in the government of Thebes, an oligarch, a friend of Sparta. <clears throat> the next day the Spartan army seized the Acropolis of Thebes, which is called Academia. They did so on the day, a sacred day, a holiday was being celebrated. Everybody was in the same shape people are on, on a holiday. Uh, nobody was ready. The, uh, they took the city. The enemies of the dominant party that had invited the Spartans in were put to death if they could not flee successfully. The Spartans left a garrison on the Cadmia and took control of the city and, and had their stooges run the city thereafter. <clears throat> now this had not been determined by the Spartan assembly. This was not the consequence of a policy decision that the Spartan uh, officials or people had made. Uh, when Phoebus came back to Sparta, he was put on trial. And uh, there was great anger against him, and there was great anger against him of, against Sparta, of course, throughout the Greek world. Um, there was no real case for him, but surprisingly enough, even though he was not a member of Agesilaus' faction, Agesilaus got up at the uh, trial <clears throat> and simply said, you guys are all talking about the wrong thing. There's only one question that should be asked about the behavior of Phoebus. Did what he did was what, was what he did good or bad for Sparta? Well, it was obviously good. Why in the world do you want to punish him? And he was not punished with any severity. A mild fine, or at least a fine, was imposed. We don't know if he ever paid it. 
In any case, the critical thing was what would Sparta do about the action itself, the fact that it had a garrison up there on the Cadmea. If they thought it had been the wrong thing to do, if it had been the idea of Phoebidas and what didn't represent Spartan policy, they should have withdrawn the garrison. The garrison stayed. So that Sparta now, this was something that rang all around the Greek world. This was the worst thing anybody could remember. In peacetime, with no allegation of cause, they had simply seized another city, an ancient city, a great city, and they refused to back off. <clears throat> Finally, there's one other um, um, example of this uh, same kind of behavior. The government in Thebes was tyrannical, imposed upon an unwilling people. Uh, some of the people who had fled it would, did a reverse of what had happened in the time of the 30 tyrants in Athens. They fled to Athens. And of course, the Athenians gave them support and uh, protected them. And then in 379, a small number of these exiles launched a clever plot that allowed them to sneak into um, Thebes and to make their way to the Cadmea and to kill the oligarchic leaders of the city in the dark when nobody could really do anything about it and to, to drive away a number of the Spartans and to free the city. Uh, Thebes became free. It became democratic, too, because these people now belong to a democratic faction. And more and more, if you're a Democrat, you're anti-Spartan. If you're an oligarch, you're pro-Spartan. And so uh, all of this is the beginning of what we'll get to next time, which is the flowering of Theban power. It's going to happen as they get stronger and stronger. But the event I wanted to uh, mention as the, the twin of the Phoebidas thing is that in 379, a Spartan a harmost of one of the uh, garrisons in Boeotia by the name of Svadrias took a force by night, marched into Attica. Ostensibly, his plan was to reach the uh, Piraeus and then that would allow them to take control of Athens because they could cut them off from their port at the sea. He didn't get it quite right. By the time morning broke and they were visible, he was still miles and miles and miles away from the Piraeus. And so all he could do was to do some harm to the Athenian territory and then to go home. Well, when he got home again, he hadn't gotten any vote from the Spartan assembly or from the Gerasida or from the efforts to do anything. Another a thing that he had apparently done on his own. So there was another trial. And uh, this time, um, the only thing he had going for him, apparently, well, he, always, he still had Agesilaus's general approach, but he was the lover of the son of Agesilaus. And so Agesilaus, who ostensibly was uh, hostile to what had happened, uh, was made to speak in his defense. And this time, his argument was simply, uh, Sparta has too few men of quality to be able to execute any for whatever reason whatsoever, and so we shouldn't do anything to Svadrias. So they didn't. And that was yet another signal, and it had fantastic consequences in S Athens. They had been holding some Spartan ambassadors when the, uh, when the Svadrias raid had taken place, and they were holding them in effect as hostages, but the, the, the Spartans said, look, we had nothing to do with it. This was, Svatrius did it all on his own. He'll certainly be condemned when he gets back to Sparta. So the Athenians said, okay, you can go home. And then he wasn't. And so the Athenians now were determined that they would have to fight Sparta. And in the process, they set about organizing an alliance a general alliance meant against Sparta, which they were able to do in considerable part because of all of the irritation that had been felt all around Greece by these terrible actions of the Spartans. And uh, as I think I'll tell you next time, they put together what we call the Second Athenian Confederation, and they made an alliance with the newly liberated Thebes Thebes, which is going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And so we have now 
a threat once again to the Spartan hegemony, which will be very serious, but of a different kind from the one we had before. I'll tell you about it next time.